Welcome everybody, yes, and, and Shmuel especially, who we will hear from later in the program. Um, we're all grieving with you both at uh, the recent horror murders. That's all we can explain them as, really, here in Israel, and I imagine you'll be sharing some of those incidences with us, Sandra. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you and leave you to introduce your Shmuel also. Okay, so welcome yeah. everybody. Um, yes, uh, I did, I know, as Joy mentioned, Shmuel Younger is with us today. Uh, and Shmuel is uh, literally my right-hand man. He's officially Director of Development but uh, he's done for, he's been involved very, very much so in getting to know our friends and supporters in the United States. Uh, he's been with us for a few years already and uh, more and more now. It would have been in the past two years if you guys from Australia and Britain and all these other places were able to come to Israel, then you would of course met Shmuel here in Israel. But uh, now, you know, Shmuel, is, it's time for him to get to know our Australians, and that's part of the reason why he's on board, and he will be sharing with us later. Okay, so I want to, um, you know, as always, we start with an Israel update, and as you mentioned, Joy, uh, things are not uh, doing so well in Israel uh, on, in many, many ways. Uh, we have both a tremendous ups upsurge in terrorism, uh, when we met last month, we had, were already seeing some of that. And I brought you up to date on some of those terrible incidents that had happened in Chadera and in Beersheba and, and other places. And unfortunately today, I am coming to you with news of even additional events just to bring you up to date on some of the most recent ones. Um, just over a week ago on Friday night, there was uh, an attack at the entrance to Ariel, uh, as in all the communities in Judea and Samaria, we have um, we have uh, these kind of guard booths that stand at the entrance to a community, and there's always somebody standing there uh, to protect the community and just to make sure that someone's coming in is coming in for the right reasons and not for the wrong reasons. Um, unfortunately, on that Friday night, there was a young man who was there guarding, and he was with his fiance, who also was one of the security guards. In fact, I believe that's how they met, uh, both doing, you know, working as uh, guards in Ariel, and a terrorist drove up and opened fire. Um, this young man had enough uh, ability to respond immediately, understand what was going on, and he shielded his fiance. He took the bullets, he was killed and his fiance uh, was saved. Uh, a terrible, terrible event. And the way it was analyzed, it was analyzed many ways. And of course they had cameras afterwards, et cetera. Um, it, it seemed that, that first of all, it was definitely an attack that was prepared in advance and that the way they came at them, um, they had almost no opportunity to respond in a way that would have protected them and shot the terrorists. Uh, and, and, and that's, of course, terrible. Now, what happened after that was um, this, this, um, this woman who was protected, she was able to call the emergency, and, but the terrorists were faster. They immediately, they were in a car, they turned around and they drove away. And then began a chase all night long uh, to see if they could find these terrorists. And that is something that is very, very um, typical when there's a terrorist attack. Uh, there comes a, a coordinated, uh, coordinated, uh, let's say, um, a coordinated initiative to find the terrorists. And there's two things that we need to make sure of. One, of course, we want to find the terrorists and we want to make sure they don't do this again. But we want to make sure that they are not still in immediate danger to, to the area. Are they now going to go off and start killing people in other places? And this becomes, of course, a major, major issue. So it's not just 
catching the perpetrator and bringing him to justice or whatever. It's to make sure that this event is over and it won't become further terrorist attacks. Now, I can tell you a personal story. That Friday night, my son, we live in Carnation Moron. Ariel is just south of us, okay? I would say uh, to drive there is about 20 minutes drive. Um, but through the mountains, it's a bit faster. And we live living in Carnation Moron. What they did is through the cameras and through some of the other things that they had, they understood the direction that these terrorists had, were going, okay? And so they knew that they had moved in the direction of an Arab village, which is in between Ariel and Carnation Moron. And so what they did is they called out the rapid response teams. Now, every single community in Judea and Samaria has at least one rapid response teams. Some have more. Our community, for example, has five because we're a very big community. I think actually we have now a sixth. You know, so bigger communities need more rapid response teams, each one assigned to a particular area. But in the time of an emergency, all of them may be called out because you need all of them, you know, out there doing what has to be done. And the role of a rapid response team, first of all, everyone has on in his possession at all times a weapon and has a helmet and a bulletproof vest and has some kind of communication, walkie talkie, uh, whatever, some kind of communication device and therefore is on call and is able to respond. And so these people are there to supplement the military and in coordination with the military. These are not militias or anything like that. This is all coordinated. And at a time like this, when we have to make sure, number one, that the people in all these communities are protected while the army is chasing after the uh, terrorists, the people in the rapid response teams are making sure that the people in the community are safe. So for example, my son who was in this, is in this, um, uh, rapid response team in Carnation Rome. He was woken up in the middle of the night. This was Shabbat. This was Friday night. You need to go to a particular place to guard that community and make sure nobody is coming up the hill, you know, terrorists coming up the hill to uh, attack this community. That went on all night. So it was only at six in the morning that they captured the terrorists and therefore the all clear went out. So um, this was something, it's not just a question of who is murdered, which is terrible, but how this affects an entire region. And I have to say something to you who have been our regular supporters for so many years. One of the things that we have been very helpful to in these communities is providing the equipment that is needed for these rapid response teams. Thanks to your donations, we have bought helmets, we have bought bulletproof belts, we have bought um, walkie talkies, we never buy um, the, the actual military equipment, the guns, the army, the armory, et cetera. Uh, that's something that's provided by the army. Uh, these are civilian teams, but this is something that you have provided and helped make sure that our, uh, our teams, are they're all volunteers. Uh, my son is not in security. My son, he does his reserve dirty in the army, but he's a teacher. He's a school teacher, okay? But these are people who volunteer and will therefore be called out. So this is this is just a little bit of that. Now, it was a terrible tragedy with this man. As I said, it was his fiance who we had protected, but he was killed. And on the, he was killed for Friday night. On that Sunday, the fian his fiance uh, and his parents, and they all joined together. Instead of, to they were gonna get together that day to plan the wedding, and instead they buried him. So it was a terrible, terrible tragedy. And, and, you know, we were reeling from that. And then we went into what is actually a very interesting week in Israel last week. We have Memorial Day for the falling soldiers and we have uh, Israel Independence Day. One comes right, you know, first we remember our fallen soldiers. And of course, on that day, the day of remembering the fallen soldiers is also a day that we remember our terrorist victims. And that was a particularly moving day because there were so many fresh victims. You know, we had this young man who was killed in Ariel and we had the, the victims that had been killed 
uh, over the past few weeks. And so there was a, there were many interviews with these family members. Um, it was so fresh. You know, some people were saying here every year we stood in silence and mourned for people we didn't know. And now we are standing in silence and mourning for people who are our loved ones. And it was a very moving thing. But we go from that day right into Israel Independence Day, which is always an emotional roller coaster uh, to go from a day of, of real mourning. And for those of you who have not been in Israel on these days, it really is really unique. Um, I don't know of another country where the Memorial Day is as personal to each and every citizen as it is in Israel. Uh, even if you don't, first of all, almost everybody, I don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody who was either injured or killed in a war, you know, as a soldier or in a terrorist attack. So it really is personal. But even if there's, you happen to be this, amongst these few people who don't know anyone personally, um, you feel it personally, because if you don't know someone personally, your cousin does, your neighbor does. And it's, so it's a very, very, very personal kind of mourning um, where it's national, of course, but it's, it's personal. And then we switch. And this, of course, happened on last week, Wednesday night. We go from a day of mourning to a day of amazing celebration, where we celebrate the miracle that is the establishment of the state of Israel. And, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know this so well how um, we went from the depths of the despair. We went from dispersion all over the world, uh, tremendous anti-Semitism culminating in the Holocaust, uh, almost 2000 years of exile, and all of that comes to an end in, in May of 1948. And all of a sudden we are, we built, we have a state of our own, a state of our own that is not just, oh wow, you know, we have a safe haven from anti-Semitism now, a state of our own that is the fulfillment and realization of the biblical prophecies. It is God's original promise to Abraham going back 4,000 years when he tells them, I'm giving you the land as an everlasting possession. And it proves to us that even after a period of enormous exile and dispersion, uh, God says in Deuteronomy 30, I will gather you up from the four corners of the earth. All of that comes true. And this is the miracle we celebrate. And while it is a national holiday and people all over the country are celebrating and picnicking and, you know, waving flags and singing and there's um, celebrations in all the towns and cities and villages and, and performances and singing and dancing in the streets and lots and lots of fun. Um, as people of faith, for us, it is not just a national holiday. It is also a deeply spiritual holiday. Uh, and we have special prayers and it all goes together. It's not like religious people pray and the secular people dance. We pray and we dance and it's a national holiday and it's a religious holiday and it's all combined. So you can imagine how, even though it's been a diff difficult few weeks, um, this holiday is felt so intensely. Um, but then you, of course, you can imagine how terrible, even more terrible it was when just towards the end of the day, Thursday, you know, our holidays always begin the night before. So we began Wednesday night and Thursday, just as the holiday was ending, people are coming back from their days out on picnics and visiting friends and having a good time. In the city of El Ad, you have these terrorists, two terrorists who um, came into the community and started murdering people right and left. They had an ax and a knife and they were just injuring and murdering people. Um, what came out afterwards, it seems that these were two people, Arabs, who worked in El Ad. People knew them, people trusted them. They thought they were, you know, yes, they were Arabs, but they thought that they were good people because they worked in El Ad and people knew them. The fact that they worked in El Ad though meant they knew that the town really, really well. They knew exactly where everything was. And they called a fellow who is a taxi driver and very often drives Arabs from, you know, the checkpoints or wherever, where they cross from Judea and Samaria, dry, driving them into Elad. And they pick, and they say, can we pick them up? We need a ride. And he didn't suspect anything because he thought, yeah, they work here. And they said he was coming in because he had some stuff to do. And they picked him up and they brought him in 
They entered Elad. He that they then stabbed the taxi driver. Okay, and then you know went on this uh, continued this uh, murderous, you know, terrible, terrible uh, massacre that left three people. Three people were murdered in this attack. Um, and, and, and people were all outside. It, it was like, it, you know, in fact, when the, when people realized what was happening and the, and the military came and the police and everybody came and they're trying to figure out what's going on, um, the streets are full of people because it's the end of a holiday. Everybody's outside. And it was terrible, terrible thing. Um, it took days, days until they found uh, these terrorists, they ended up finding up they had been hiding out in a forested area just outside the community. Uh, El Ad is not in Judea and Samaria. It's just across uh, the pre-67 line from Samaria. They did not go back into Samaria. They remained in Israel. I think they realized that all of the, any way to cross over into Judea and Samaria was being heavily monitored by the army. So they didn't want to take that chance. But thank God they were ultimately caught. But if that wasn't, you know, the end of it, just um, two nights ago, uh, in Tekoa, in a community in Judea, just south of Jerusalem, very close to Bethlehem, uh, there's a fellow, he's out in his garden, drinking tea with his wife at the end of the day, and he sees something suspicious out in his backyard. And... Uh, he goes out and he sees his yard is at the edge of the community. And there's right there is a fence um, that is the fence that surrounds the community. And he sees somebody climbing over the fence. So he, this guy happens to be a member of the rapid response team. He happens to be a very you know professional security fellow. And he calls out to him, what are you doing? What's going on? Becomes clear this is a terrorist. He starts chasing him with a knife trying to get into his house. And luckily this fellow had his, had his weapon with him and he ended up killing him. He was actually very, very funny in a way, if you could be funny in an event like this. But he said, I saw him interviewed and he said, well, when I realized he was about to kill me, I arranged for him to have a date with 72 virgins in heaven, which of course is what these uh, Arab terrorists believe in. You know, they said they're going to be a, a shaheed, they're going to be a martyr, and, you know, Allah is going to arrange for them a date with 72 virgins. So when he did that, that kind of brought a bit of black humor into the situation. But, you know, he was then talking, and of course, you can imagine how frightening it is. He has young children in the house. When he sees this suspicious guy, the first thing he does, he says to his wife, go in, make sure the kids are safe, lock the doors, close the windows. He gets his weapon, and he goes out, and of course, ends up saving the day. He is lauded all over Israel, of course, as a hero, because it is very clear, had he not had that presence of mind and that ability to neutralize a terrorist before an attack took place, his family would have been slaughtered and who knows how many other people would have been murdered. I wanna just add one more thing as I'm you know, creating this picture of events as we've experienced them, Last night, there was something very interesting on the news. There's a fellow, his name is Oad Chemo. He is a well-known journalist in Israel, and he is fluent in Arabic. It's clear that his military background included um, all kinds of uh, operations in Arab territories, and he speaks a fluent Arabic, and he always goes to very Arab areas, whether it's in Judea and Samaria or in other parts of Israel. And he has his camera, he has his microphone. Everybody knows he's an Israeli journalist. They know he's not an Arab, but he's able to speak Arabic. So he gets people talking. So he decides now, one of the things that's been happening recently, of course, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you had seen some of this. Uh, we just finished that so-called holy month of Ramadan. And during which time we had the worst of these terrorist attacks. And the focus of a lot of these was on the Temple Mount. The mosque up there, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is a place where many Muslims like to go more than usual during Ramadan and to pray. But unfortunately, they looked at it not just as a place to pray, but it is a place to, to be violent, uh, which is kind of crazy for us when we look at it, when we think of whether you as Christians or me as a Jew, you know, me and Shmuel as Jews. Um, for us, it's very clear when you have a holy time, whether it's a holy day or a holy month, that means you pray more, you try to behave better, 
you certainly don't see this month as a time to kill more people. Uh, and unfortunately, many of our Muslim neighbors don't see it that way. Uh, and so they went on the Temple Mount, they had, um, they had rocks and stones, and they had, um, in some cases, Molotov cocktails. And from within their own mosque, they were creating fires, attacking, um, crazy, absolutely crazy. And when the Israeli army sent in or the police went in to try to create order and stop this violence, which was really protecting those Muslims who came to pray. There are Muslims who just come to pray. Uh, and yet they were criticized by Arab leaders all over the world, not less by uh, the Arab members of Knesset in our own country, including Mahmoud Abbas and his party, which is now part of the government. We've talked about this before, a very problematic part of the government. And instead of coming forward and trying to create calm and say, guys, look, uh, you have full freedom. We know as citizens of Israel, you have full freedom to pray on Al-Aqsa. Um, the only thing the police are doing there is to, so that you're not hurting each other or hurting somebody else. A mosque is not a place for violence. Instead of saying that, he comes out and says, this is terrible that the police went in to the Temple Mount and, and to stop the violence, blaming it all on the Israeli police. You know, So people in Israel today, and I would say there has created quite a consensus now, both from right to left and everyone in between that are saying there's something wrong with this picture. OK, what is going on here? So I'll go back to this journalist, Oad Chemo. So he wants to see what's going on among the Arabs of Jerusalem. Now, the Arabs of Jerusalem, they are permanent citizens of Israel. They're not they're not exactly citizens. They're permanent, excuse me, permanent residents. They're not technically citizens, but they have all the rights and obligations uh, of citizens, except that they don't have to serve in the army and they don't vote for prime minister in the Knesset, but they vote for municipal elections and they get all the benefits, you know, all the assistance, education, welfare payments, and you name it, free health care, uh, everything. OK, so these are people that live within Israel. This is not anywhere that has anything to do with the Palestinian Authority uh, officially. OK, what happens? He goes into the streets of Jerusalem, into Arab neighborhoods, and he starts interviewing people. By, ch by chance, he's and, and I heard him interviewed afterwards as well. And he said, look, I did not stage this. I just went around and said, talk to me. And all kinds of different people, mostly young people, but not only. And he asked them, what do you think about what's going on? And they said, every single one, we love Hamas. For us, El-Aqsa, this mosque on the Temple Mount is the most important. It is ours. It doesn't belong to anybody else. We will not tolerate Anybody else going up to the Temple Mount to pray, whether they're Jews, whether they're Christians, nobody else has a right. And then they said something else. We believe every Jew needs to be killed. This journalist is talking Arabic to these guys, and he says to them, I'm Jewish. Do you think I should be killed? And they said, yes. This is amazing. And then I realized afterwards, not only... Is, is this revealing to us? And look, I can't say we're falling off our chairs in major surprise. We know that this feeling is out there, okay? But it seems to us that it's much more radical and much more dangerous than ever before. The irony, of course, is for an Arab like this to stand up and say, I want to kill you, whoever it is, Jew or whatever, but to say to this journalist's face, I want to kill you, and the ability of, and these guys were also criticizing the Palestinian Authority. They hate the Palestinian Authority. They like Hamas. They only like the most radical, religious, whatever, violent people. If they were to say that in an area that is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, they would be dead. Israel is where they have total freedom of speech. Even the freedom of speech to say to a Jew standing in front of him, I want to kill you. Isn't this crazy? Isn't this insane? They are benefiting from all these freedoms and all they want to do is to destroy us, kill us as individuals, destroy our country. It's, it's beyond crazy, but that is the situation. Now, um, I just want to end with a few other things that have happened that have been um, particularly disturbing, okay, when we talk about this update. 
So first of all, if we go back to the Temple Mount, as I mentioned, we have um, countries all over the world. The Arab countries, of course, are all condemning Israel, even those who are at peace with us. Um, and there was this statement that was put out recently uh, about, well, and it seems the government has decided, okay, we're not, we're, it's very difficult for us to decide how we're going to bring peace on the Temple Mount. We're gonna turn to Jordan. Okay, now tradition. Now, just so you should know, legally, the Temple Mount is in the complete sovereignty of the state of Israel. However, in the treaty between Israel and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, there's there's a, a sentence there that says Jordan will ha will have a special relationship uh, with on the issue of the Temple Mount, and what that should mean is that you update Jordan and you respect him and you honor him and you realize it's a religious place, okay? But if you're about to figure out what to do, like for example, if someone's gonna want to, um, uh, I don't know, do some kind of refurbishment of the El Aqsa Mosque or of the Dome of the Rock, that's something that they coordinate with Jordan just to make sure that Jordan isn't left out of the picture and they feel good, okay? But, when you have to decide as sovereign Israel, how are you gonna ensure that people are safe and protected when they're on the Temple Mount or when they're down below at the Western Wall at the Kotel, that's not something you should be asking another sovereign country. You should not be going to Jordan saying, what do you think, okay? So this has already created a lot of question marks in our minds. One more thing that I think is very important to bring up aside from all the terrorism, for months and months already, and I think I may have mentioned this before, uh, this we have been concerned on the one hand when Bennett became prime minister, and you all know but Bennett was always very right wing. Uh, he had always mentioned that he was very supportive of expansion of the communities in Judea and Samaria, and he promised that he would continue allowing expansion, building of new homes in Judea and Samaria. Unfortunately, however, the committee that actually decides on, on those uh, building requests has not convened since this government came into power last summer. And this, of course, has been a, a quite an issue of concern. A lot of the um, mayors and residents in Judea and Samaria and from other places are pressuring the government this is not right. More and more plans have been filed of, of uh, new projects, new developments, new homes, and they and they need to be approved. Now, just the very fact that in Judean Samaria building is approved by the central government as opposed to by the, the regional council or by the local municipality, that in itself is crazy. And the only reason that happens, and this has already been, that's been the case since 1967, the only reason that happens is because the government and particularly the prime minister, whoever it was, <laughs> has always felt that they, because it is such a politically controversial issue, it cannot be something that is decided just on the pace of market forces or on supply and demand or whatever, environment, etc. has to be decided based on political issues. Now, this is something that I have personally had tremendous uh, opposite. I, I just am so opposed to this whole idea. Um, I've always been. And it's one of the reasons I feel it's very important to apply sovereignty in Judea and Samaria so that we can go back to developing houses the way everybody else does in the rest of the country and the rest of the world. I was always upset every time we would hear, uh, for example, Netanyahu, who was very in favor of building in Judea and Samaria, I would be very upset when he was negotiating with the president of the United States, whoever that president was, about how much building. I'm thinking, this is insane. Well, the same thing is happening now. So it seems that there were 5,800 housing units that were waiting for approval by this committee. Bennett, realizing that he was under tremendous pressure, decided he has to convene this committee and he convenes, he's about to convene the committee, he hasn't convened yet, but they're about to convene. And already it becomes known that instead of approving 5,800 units, they're gonna only approve 4,000. This is the story as it has been reported. I was not there, but this is what they are saying. Bennett calls up Biden or Biden calls up Bennett or whatever. They have a conversation. And Biden says, I will not tolerate any building in Judea and Samaria. This is terrible, which we know is his point of view. And it's actually been the point of view of 
all the presidents of the United States, with a small example of Trump, who was a little bit more flexible on that issue, but he certainly wasn't saying build as much as you want. Okay, fine. Allies are allowed to disagree. We are allowed to say, I'm sorry, I respect you. I remember Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Shamir, one of my heroes, okay? He would be facing the first President Bush, who was extremely hostile to Israel, and especially on this issue. And he would, you know, Bush would talk to Shamir, and he would say, don't you dare, and you better not. And he would talk to him like a little boy, which was easy because Shamir was a very short man, okay? So he'd like look down at him, and he would say, you're, this is terrible, and don't you do it. And Mr. Shamir never, ever lost his cool. He would look at the president. He would say, Mr. President, I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you so much for your advice. I will definitely take it under consideration. He would go back to Israel and he would let them build whatever he wanted. Okay, that was Shamir. Not so with a lot of the other people that have come since. So it seems that what happened was Bennett said to Biden, look, if I don't approve this building, this government is going to fall. The assumption being that then Netanyahu becomes prime minister and Biden really doesn't want Netanyahu to be prime minister. And Biden basically says, I don't care. I'm not going to be happy with any kind of building. And so Bennett kind of is offering this compromise. Well, I'm going to get rid of 1800 units. Now, of course, it doesn't matter because whether you build 4000 or you build 5800, Biden is still going to be mad. So what are you doing getting rid of 1800? Just build all the 5800. Anyway, that is where we are now. And we're hoping one of the things that did come out, though, that among those 4,000 include is including building in Mitzpadani. I know, Joy, you were in Mitzpadani. It was this little teeny hilltop community that is at the eastern edge of Samaria, overlooks the Jordan Valley. And there's this beautiful overlook there that we've taken some of you to and it's just a wonderful, gorgeous place. And it is a place that we've also been very involved in their security equipment. We bought them a drone. I think, Joy, when you were there, they showed you the drone that, that came up and, and then you could see, you know, what it looked like to see all of. So it is a community that is very near and dear to our hearts. And so it is very, I'm very happy that they are included in this. But of course, uh, I would like to see more happening. Uh, what we're seeing here, I would say, and I, we've discussed this in the past, we are seeing politicians that, and I do believe that Netanyahu and Bennett and Ayala Chakade and a lot of these other people really and truly care about Israel, really truly care about Judea and Samaria and would like to have more building and would like to you know, see more things happening. Two things get in the way when they get into power. One is ego. And we've seen that all along. The ability, for example, this government is currently really teetering, okay? They don't have a majority. They are not able to put forth any laws that they're not going to be able to have people from the opposition support. People in the opposition are only going to support laws that are clearly something that they will approve of, not just, you know, any old thing. And um, so it's really a mess. And we don't know how long this government will last, probably not very long at all, which means we're in a sense of a, a period of instability, which also may mean that one of the reasons we're seeing people like those young people in East Jerusalem talking so blatantly against Israel is because they're sensing we have a vulnerable government, okay? And that, that I don't know, let's say puts out a, a sense of, of, of weakness on Israel even though the reality is when it comes to security issues, there is no weakness and the whole country is unified to fight terrorism and, and to make sure that these Arab crazies don't take over our lives. On that, there's absolutely no conflict in the country, but still sometimes when you have a weak government, that is how it is, it is seen. Um, that's a problem. That's definitely a, a problem, but there's another problem. And that is something I remember Ariel Sharon many years ago, when they, he first put forward this idea of disengagement, of, of, and of, unfortunately, it was a terrible tragedy. They pulled out from, Jude from Gaza and they destroyed all the communities that were there. And about 9,000 people were forcibly removed from their homes. It was a terrible, terrible thing. Those of you who might remember it, took place in 2005. At that point, now Sharon, before that, had been one of the biggest advocates of settlement in Judea and Samaria. And they said to him, what happened to you? What happened to you? How did you change your mind? And what do you say? Things you see from when you're 
outside the government or where you're not the prime minister, once you come into the prime minister's seat, you see things differently. Okay. Now, I don't believe in that statement. I mean, yes, no question. You are made to understand all kinds of different things. But if you start seeing things differently, there's something wrong with your vision. Okay. And that just leads me to a message from the Bible that I just want to leave you with on this part of our, our talk today. And this is King David. And if you remember King David before he was king, he was this young man, very handsome, a musician, not a soldier. And yet he was the one who went to stand up before Goliath. And through his cleverness and through assistance from God, of course, he got rid of that giant and made an amazing impression. And what did he say? Okay, just before he goes out there, people are looking at him and they're saying, what, what is this? How are you gonna do this? You're just this kid, you know? What do you have in mind? How are you gonna do this? And what does he say? And, and they're saying that to him and he answers to them. He says, look, you know, you just see what I'm gonna do. And then he comes up to, to Goliath himself. And, and, the, and the Philistine, Goliath curses David and he says, come here. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. He is extremely arrogant. He says, I'm a giant. I represent the Philistines. We are so powerful. Who are you? You're just a little fly. And what does David answer him? David replied to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the ranks of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will kill you and cut off your head and I will give the carcasses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth. All the earth shall know that there is a God in Israel. He takes the Goliath's words about giving his carcass to the birds and the beasts. And he says, I'm going to do that to you. Why? Because I come in the name of the Lord of hosts, God uh, of Israel. And we see later on in Psalms, in a Psalm that he himself writes, then he echoes that very same sentiment and it becomes a, a major, um, major sentiment or major idea in King David and an idea that he teaches all of us. And I believe we need to take it by heart. In Psalm 20, verse 8, they, referring to our enemies, to, to the nations, they call on chariots, they call on horses. But we call on the name of the Lord, our God. They collapse and lie fallen, but we rally and gather strength. Oh, Lord, grant victory. May the king answer us when we call. And I think this is really the key to everything, isn't it? We have to look to our politicians. They're smart. They know how to handle things. But we have to be very concerned when two things get in the way. Their ego on the one hand and their lack of vision. Their vision needs to include the fact we you come with swords and chariots. We come in the name of the Lord, our God. Now, thank God, Israel is today a very powerful country. So we also have chariots and swords and all that stuff. But we are facing terrible odds very often. And thank God. And this is what we have to remember. We're doing the right thing because we're coming in the name of the Lord, our God, and we're following God's plan. With that, I want to turn the meeting over to Shmuel. Uh, we like to talk about a particular community every time. And Shmuel is going to share with you about his own community, the community of Sufi. Take it away, Shmuel. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for the fascinating update. Although I live in Israel and I read the news quite often, you made it to the one big story that really makes sense. And I want to add one sentence to that is that uh, the notion we have right now is, is not good. I feel that people are afraid and I think people are more alert and people are not trying to get, to be honest, I'm even considering to get a permit to hold a, a gun because it comes from different directions. They're trying to surprise us. Elad, Bnei Brak, Tel Aviv, Tkoa, you don't know where it's going to come. Only yesterday, um, between uh, the office in Kanesha Moron and here, there was a bus that targeted with five uh, Molotov bottles on it. In Azun, which is a village between us, there was a protest. And while you were talking, Sandra, 
I received a message saying there is something, an explosive in Karnesha Malone Junction, and they're closing the, the road to see what happens there. While you were talking now. Wow. So it is, um, I'm, I'm worried. And I think people are alert. And I want to say that in my personal perspective, uh, uh, the biggest concern we have right now is the fact that when you see, when it comes from different angles, uh, you understand that uh, our neighbors, and actually sometimes it's the people that live in, the, in, in Judea and Samaria, but even Israeli Arabs, uh, they woke up one day and they felt they feel more loose and comfortable to do whatever they want. May, it's the coalition, it's the fact that we have Arabs in the coalition as well, it's one of the reasons. But altogether, and I'm not going to go to this update because it was beautiful, the, the feeling is concerned. So today, uh, um, I want to thank everyone um, for having me. Uh, my name is Shmuel Junger, as I said, as Sandra said, and I am part of the office for um, four years now. And just a bit of uh, here. I just received a message saying the junction is back and it's open. You should know. Um, and before that, before um, joining uh, CFOSC, um, I actually came from, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving backwards. I came from a four year um, educational position in Hong Kong where I was the head of Jewish studies. And I'm saying Hong Kong, which was close to Australia. So I had to go and visit as well. I went to New Zealand as well, a lovely area. Then um, before that, I was a lawyer. And that's what you do apparently in CFOIC because Sandra was a lawyer as well. Where I did my time. I served my time and I'm free. And before that, I've learned several years in a yeshiva, which is basically a biblical uh, school for adults after the army. Um, I served three years in field intelligence, and before that I um, learned in an high school in Israel, and you go back and back and back, and you will see that I was born and raised in Israel, and all the moves that I did were like classic Israeli moves, and then I've joined CFOIC, which is not a classic Israeli move, because um, I, I, I practiced my English quite often, as you see, but I was born and raised here. And uh, with all that, I'm pleased to be here and pleased to be part of this amazing mission. So today I want to share with you about my community of Tzufim. Tzufim is literally 10 minutes from Karnesh uh, towards the east side and west. west side. And I'm actually on what you would call the border of the 67 line, the green line. Um, but to be honest, although we are part, this community is part of Samaria municipal government, we are inside the borders of what you would call Israel. That means we are not inside the green line, we are outside of the green line. Um, and I'll explain why it's important in a second. So Tufim is a community with 650 families. And it's getting bigger and bigger as we speak. And the fun fact is this. Fun for many, not for me, for me so much. My parents-in-law live in this community. My wife <laughs> was born and raised in this community. No, no, that's not the sad part. I'll tell you what's the sad <laughs> part. The sad part is this. When they established this community 20-something years ago, they lived... I'm, I'm, I'm pointing, it's, there's a hill and there's like almost like a valley and all the older houses are in the valley. And there was a mountain here. When I met my wife 11 years ago, I came and there was nothing on that mountain. When you come here today, you will see hundreds of houses on this side. And the sad part for me is the fact that when we should have bought and house here many years ago where we can afford it. Now it's so expensive. People want to live here. It's a great place to live. What's important to know about Sufim is that we have a great cooperation between different sectors of, um, of 
I would say, uh, community, communities. We have religious people. We have non-religious people. We have younger generations that just move here, and we have an older generation that established this community. And we really are bringing together many, many different colors and voices to the community. And 650 families is only the beginning. Right now, as Sandra mentioned, there was an approval for extra 160 houses in the region and in this community. But the plan is to double this place and to build from literally every direction. And why would you come to Tufin? If you're a, a young couple and you want to choose a place to live, what would you call to come to Tufim? Because I feel that what Tufim really has is this um, a natural place to grow. You still have the feeling of a small village, a, a small community, and yet you're not so distant from the big cities. So people can drive. It takes them a lot. There's a lot of traffic, 40, 50 minutes. They need to drive to Tel Aviv. But you have, when you go back in the end of the day, you have your quiet home and you live in a nice region. The view here is amazing. We, there's an observation point in this community called Mitzpeh Shneo. And there's a fun fact about it that Shneo is my wife's grandfather. Because if my parents, my parents-in-law um, just established Tufim, my grandmother or my wife's grandmother, actually, she established one of the first communities in Samaria called Dumim. And her husband and her, and her they left Debak, uh, the central of Israel, to establish the community. They have four children. And unfortunately, her husband, Shneel, in the age of 35, died in a bus accident. It was a bus driver, one, the first bus driver of Samaria. And a car crashed into him or something, and not far from here, and, and he died. He left a widow with four children. He was 35, as I said, and she lived in Kdumim all her life. She had three children um, that stayed in Samaria. One left Samaria, and the eldest daughter, Yael, she established the community here in Sufim. Now, if you do the math, it means that my kids are the fourth generation in Samaria. It's quite rare, to be honest. Somebody who established one community, his daughter established a community, and then the daughter lives here, and she brings children here. So four generations living in Samaria. Uh, another thing about this community is that we just opened a school this year. I can tell you that I'm quite involved in this school. Uh, and again, as we said, it's one of the... Um, I would say not maybe a challenge you can call it, but maybe a great thing is because there's a new wave of new younger families. Now there's new needs. And the new need was we don't want to ride the bus 15 minutes to Kohav Yair, a community nearby, or 20 minutes to um, um, Kaneshamon. Because my son is in the third grade. He actually learns in the same class with Sandra's grandson. They learn the same class, and he needs to drive to school in a bulletproof bus. Now, not that fun, I would say, but more than that, it's time, and you need to wake up, and you need to get the bus, and if you miss the bus, how are you going to get to school? Sandra is nodding, but you live in Kanesha One. We need to do this bus. I can tell you that many of the parents here didn't like the fact that their kids are going on the bus every day, so we established a new school. Now you established a new school, it's great. But as I mentioned in the beginning, we have religious people here, non-religious people. How can you combine education like this in one school? Mm, that's interesting, but it's gonna be for another time to discuss how you integrate between groups into one place. What I would summarize about this place is that it's a kind of a new hip, neighborhood inside a bigger community that's only going to expand we are the new generations and we're trying to make new things happening in here we have everything that we need we have a supermarket we have synagogues we have kindergarten now we're going to have a school 
So things are happening. Tufim is a great place. And when God willing, you would come to Tufim, you're going to get two things. One, you're going to get to see this observation point, that you see all of Israel, literally from Chadera to Ashdod, all of the coast is in front of you. And more than that, you will get to sit in my home and get a great cup of coffee because I'm a big fan of coffee. That's it. That's me and that's Tufim. And I wish to see you all here as soon as possible. Toda. Thank you. Do we want to do a Q&A? Thank you, Shmuel. That was amazing. Just amazing. Joy, do we want to have a bit of time for Q&A? Uh, yes, but I have a wee story I'd like to... Oh, I can't unmute. No, you are muted. You did it. Do it again. Wait. Unmute. Now you're oh, unmuted. No, no. You're fine. Okay. I am. Oh, oh, good. Yes. Just quickly going back to Mitzpah Ramon with a story I think that will speak to um, everybody. Uh, you mean that's Mitzpah where Dani? I had my heart broken. Yes, Mitzpah with, Dani. Mitzpah Dani. Yeah. I remember you taking us there and um, telling us the story about how it's named after an English um, Jewish immigrant who was killed in his own home by a Muslim and his wife and the baby still unborn went back to the States, didn't they? But years later the daughter came back and moved into this community and um, um, but I remember her saying how over the Intifada nobody was visiting, you know, they felt so lonely and um, should they be here? And then you brought a busload of Christians out there and her spirits just soared, didn't they? Um, but just putting the whole story together, it made me realise how important people, our support and our presence is to the residents, you know, in Judea, Samaria. We've sadly had to cancel our June tour, haven't we, Suzanne? I'm so sorry, Suzanne, that Son was very disappointed, as were quite a few others. Um, but I think it's understandable that people are still nervous about travelling. Janine was going to come too, but she's coming anyway, aren't you, Janine? Well, uh, we do. We are time. rescheduling the tour for yes. November, and we will be putting mm -hmm. out an email about that very soon. Yes, yes. But yes, if anyone has any questions, now's the time. Sandra, is there any more families from Ukraine coming into the community? Yes, uh, this is a fairly slow process because most of the Jews who have left the Ukraine are in these way stations and they're frankly trying to figure out what to do next. They had to make a decision to leave with literally hours. Uh, they took nothing. They have everything they own in a suitcase and they're now... Uh, you know, this was some in Poland and some in Hungary and Moldavia and all these other places. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, yesterday, I met an amazing woman, one of these Ukrainian refugees who came uh, with her family. She actually was very interesting. Just before the invasion, already Israel and the United States were saying it's going to happen. And Israel was telling all Jews and Israelis and whoever get out of Ukraine now, and they sent special planes to bring them out. But most of the people didn't believe it. And she was saying that she also, all of their friends, they didn't believe anything would happen. And then all of a sudden her husband had this sense on that morning. And he says, okay, you're leaving. They had a few hours to pack up. He was, he did not leave. He stayed back and he was fighting with them to defend Ukraine. This family, this woman, uh, and her five children were on the last plane that left Ukraine, left Kiev, and came to Israel. They were in Israel for like a week or two, somewhere, I don't know, some other town. And it turns out she, she could, there was a woman who lives in Samaria that she was friendly with in childhood, who moved to Israel about six or seven years ago from Kiev, and lives in Revava in Samaria. 
So she calls her up. She says, you need to come here. The community was just amazing. Um, they found like there's like no available housing there. They found this one little apartment that belongs to somebody, part of their house. And, you know, they could rent it out or whatever. They made this uh, apartment available to them. The, the whole community chipped in. They came to this house. There was, she, I mean, I had tears in my eyes yesterday. She said there was a pot of soup on the stove ready for them. There was all mm -hmm. kinds of food cooked. Their refrigerator was full, stocked with food. And they had linens and clothes and everything for them. And so this now has begun the beginning of a project that we are now doing that um, they're going to, we're raising money to build 10 prefab homes in that community of Rivava. And we're hoping to have, um, you know, people coming to this family that's already here. The husband came for a few weeks and then had to go back again. He's back there now. He's in Hungary. He wants to go back into the Ukraine. He's very involved with trying to help the Jewish community there. And he's going out with this message. You need to come to Israel and you need to come to Samaria. And so this is giving us great encouragement that this is happening, but it's a process. We see it's a process. And the woman herself said, I asked, where are most of these Ukrainian Jews? Where's their head? She goes, some of them have always wanted to move to Israel and just no, didn't get to it. And now are definitely moving in that direction. And there's a whole nother group that just don't know what to think. They still hope that they can go back to Ukraine. They don't know if that's a possibility. And she felt these are the kinds of people that if we get there first, they'll come to Israel. But if somebody, if Germany gets there first and say, come to Germany, they'll go to Germany. So it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge as far as I'm concerned. If they just, you know, if we, we can get at least some of them, if we can get some of these people to come, what an amazing thing it will be both for them and for us. That's great. Mm. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? That might be it, is it? Yeah. Anybody else? Otherwise, our hour is up. Um, so we might say goodbye, but don't Could forget I? to look Sorry. at the website. Hillary yes, wants to say Hillary. something. Yes, Hillary. Yes. I was just very interested if you would, I didn't know whether I should ask or not. Um, what your ideas are if this whole Bennett government crumbles and this whole issue with the rise of the rum influence and all this Jordanian and other pressure, what do you see as the likely scenarios? Do you mind me asking you that, or is that a bit traumatic? <laughs> um, not at all. I have just gotten word that people that were supposed to come in half an hour um, have just arrived. So I'm going to leave this meeting now. But Shmuel, this is in any case a question that Shmuel is really good at answering. So good. I'm going to just leave you now. But um, please, Sandra, Shmuel, next month, take it over. Ne Sandra, next Thank month, you. you'll be in America. No. No, I'll be back. You'll be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be Thank back. Thank you. Anyway, Thanks, Sandra. bye, everybody. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. We'll take bye. it over. Okay, so I will answer the question that was asked about the politics, although I'm not a prophet. I would say this. Huh. I'm so frustrated from Bennett. On a personal note, I would say that I was rooting for him for so many years, I really thought he's going to bring a change. He's going to be great. And he really betrayed me. And I cannot say anything less than betrayed. I know it's a hard word to use in English, in Hebrew, but I cannot feel, but he lied, he lied to us. Yeah. So right now, the way we see it is this. Um, if you ever went to a casino or you played the cards, you know that sometimes when the bet is so big, you need to put more inside the bet just because you're in the game already. And I think he puts so much on the table. He understands that his political life is, is done. It's done. He's never going to be elected to do anything else. Therefore, he's in a situation that he's trying to do anything possible to make his life in the politics longer. To the extent that yesterday there was a vote against the government and he used not Ram from inside, but also the Arabs from the outside to vote with the coalition. He has no boundaries. He left 
the field. Wow. If the government is going to fall down, but as I just said right now, I really feel that he's going, he's in a position that he's going to give away anything and everything to make it continue and, and go. So I don't see how it's going to be crumbled. The left understand that they're not going to be voted again because Israelis don't vote left. Bennett understand is never going to be voted yet again. So it's in everybody's interest to continue this government. Therefore, I don't predict it's going to fall. If for some reason, one day, there are three people that might wake up, Abir Kara, Nir Orbach, Ayelet Shaked, the three Yamina, y- Yemen, Yamina party uh, friends, and they're going to wake up and they're going to say, oh, we're ruining Israel, just like Edith Silman. You know the people, so I'm mentioning names. Like she woke up one day and she said, oh, no, what have I done? If they're going to do that and the government is going to fall, I predict there's going to be another election where Bibi is going to continue to try to build the government. I know it's funny to hear his name again as an option, but I really right now at this point don't see any other option but uh, Bibi. Right now, the, 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 the trial is on, doesn't look good. It looks like, like he's going to win it anyway. He, yesterday, there was a survey that he already got by himself 38, 39, 40 seats in the government. You put all the Haredim there. You put him, uh, Smotrich with nine together. We need to pray for that. But generally saying, I think it's going to be after the short observation of what left uh, looks like, I yep. think um, I think we are going to uh, see the end of it. So, do you feel the people of Israel say we've had enough of this? That's what I feel. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for being honest. I feel well, for you all very much. There's plenty of us praying, Shmuel, that yes, this government will fall because it's easy to see it's their weakness that's emboldened the Arabs, you yep. know, to do what they're doing. Mm. Um, so, yes, we're very concerned about that. Uh, um, friends, I, I also... Yes, next meeting, June 14th. I'm, I was very Go happy to, to be here. But I need to run as well. I have a package coming yes. and the guy's calling me like crazy. Yes. I want to thank you. Yes. And I hope to see you, you as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Shmuel. Bye. Thank you. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that video. And we'd like to be sure you're getting all of our video content. So just click on the subscribe button below as well as on the notification bell. And that way you will have easy access to all our material. We look forward to staying in touch with you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.